Thanks for coming to our second uh, Right Thing reading series event of the year. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, Eric Miles Williamson uh, visiting us from, uh, from Texas, where he makes his home uh, about as far south in the United States as you can get to. And now he's about as far north uh, in the United States as you can get to. So he's, he's come a long way. And uh, we're very pleased to have him. Um, and I, I am happy to see a lot of people from my fiction workshop class from last night where uh, Eric enlightened and entertained us last night and uh, that was a lot of fun as well. Uh, coming up in our series in November, uh, November 11th, we're going to have Horacio Castellanos Moya who, if you are a uh, frequent watcher, I am, I don't know how many of you are, of uh, the uh, PBS NewsHour, you might have seen last week a profile of the City of Asylums, uh, or City of Asylum Pittsburgh uh, project, which is a place uh, in Pittsburgh where they house uh, dissident uh, political writers uh, and give them uh, nice stipends uh, so that they can do their work. And Mr. Moya uh, is living there, and so we were very fortunate to get him here. He's a, a uh, a writer who got into trouble with the uh, El Salvadoran government and um, is continuing to, uh, to write now in the United States. He was a, journal, a political journalist and novelist whose work is both political and very funny and sarcastic. I'm really looking forward to that event, so I hope uh, to see you out here for that as well. Uh, tonight we're asking that uh, we put a moratorium on the blender drinks uh, during the, <laughs> the event. <laughs> we, we ran into a little bit of a, a problem with that last week, but uh, we're still ironing out the kinks of having our series in this uh, space. But this is such a wonderful space, and I'm glad you could join us up here. Uh, it's, it's, a real, uh, it's a real step up from what we've been doing the last few years, and uh, it's terrific. Of course, the, uh, the November 11th event with, uh, with uh, Horacio Castellanos Moya will be in the lecture hall. It will be a well-attended event, I promise you. We also have uh, to give a, uh, an introduction to Eric's work, uh, Professor Mark Schechner from the University of Buffalo, and he will be coming up here in a moment. Uh, but I could not resist adding my own uh, two cents uh, to an introduction of Eric Williamson. I've known him for 26 years. We went to a graduate school together at the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, creative writing program. And uh, we were roommates, actually, for, for three months. Uh, and, well, I won't tell you too much because it's, uh, it's in my text. So uh, this is called 13 Ways of Looking at Eric Williamson. When Eric and I first met in Boulder, Colorado in 1984, we were both newly admitted master's students in the creative writing program at the University of Colorado. I ran into him on the interior stairs, one of us going in, the other coming out of the building. I had read some descriptive prose of his when the work of some of the new grad students was passed around, and I told him I liked what he was doing, which was a little bit of a lie, but hey, I wanted to make friends. He stood there listening to me, his breathing getting heavier and heavier, his eyes widening, temples pulsing like he wanted to kick the shit out of me. <laughs> he was from the West, California. I was from the East, New York. I thought, this guy's crazy. I better watch him. So we ended up moving in together. I liked, too. I liked Eric's novel, Welcome to Oakland, and I told him that, but I had some problems with it, and I hadn't told him that. Finally, I made myself say it, because writers prize honesty in other writers when they talk about writing. I think you've got a woman problem in the book, Eric. It's not just the narrator, it's you. You're a misogynist. Eric said, of course I am, Ted. Three. I'm not one of those wine-drinking, sushi-eating faggots who takes up causes because he never had, he's never had anything to do with, says T. Bird Murphy, the narrator of Welcome to Oakland. Men who, men who call themselves feminists. Good God! <laughs> Eric says he was thinking of me when he wrote this. <laughs> I roomed with Eric for three months in Boulder before I kicked him out to move my girlfriend in, who later became my first wife. Eric remembers things about this time in 1984, like the fact that I left dishes in the sink constantly, or, or things I said in particular places on particular days that I have completely forgotten. 
Allen Ginsberg, called Jack Kerouac, the great rememberer. Eric is also. Five, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird is a famous Wallace Stevens poem. Eric and I both studied with professor, novelist, critic, and publisher Ron Sukunik. Sukunik wrote a great book about Stevens, a difficult poet, musing the obscure. Sukunik was also fond of rigorous, even mathematical, formal devices in his books. Each of the sentences in this paragraph has 13 words, including this here. Six, I'm resisting simply listing a bunch of great Williamson sentences. He is such a fine sentence writer. Seven, this one is chosen more or less at random from Welcome to Oakland. I kept playing cumbias and rancheras and merengue with los asesinos in the Mexican nightclubs and weddings and quinceaneras and parties while working days as a laborer, my most recent gig running the tar mop on commercial roofs, warehouses mostly nasty, rusted, oversized, corrugated tin sheds, sweating my ass off in the crude oil steam, actually getting to li like the smell. Count the languages, the senses, the particular details, and feel the movement of place to place in that one. Eight. Ron Sukunik once said to Donald Barthelme, another of Eric's mentors, that Barthelme wrote great sentences. Barthelme interpreted this as an insult, thinking Ron meant he couldn't sustain ideas for the length of full books, and it was all Sukunik could do to keep Barthelme from punching him in the face. Nine, Eric plays trumpet, and he could talk to you all night, all semester, all year, without stop, about music. His middle name is Miles. <laughs> 10. I'm glad I don't live around Williamson anymore because the hangovers would get to be a real drag. 11. Gertrude Stein famously said about Oakland, there is no there there. Eric probably could have taken her to places where she would have discovered much too much there there. 12. Even I'm starting to get bored with this. 13. I love Eric Williamson and I have fought with him like a brother. Here's Mark Schechter. I can't follow that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go on slightly longer. There will be time for Eric toward the end of this. <laughs> uh, I, I teach in the English department at UB, and I got to know Eric uh, six years ago. Seven years ago? Six? I think more like eight. Pardon? About eight. Eight, yeah. Uh, he had applied for a job in our department, uh, along with a number of other novelists. And uh, I, we got about 50 novels uh, as part of the application. It was uh, an absolute tsunami of prose. It was overwhelming. Um, and it's significant that uh, Eric's novel, East Bay, Greece, was the only novel of that batch that I read all the way through. I didn't finish the other one. I finished East Bay, Greece. Um, I have to say that there was something about it, something special to me, the voice that uh, Ted refers to, and there was something else. For me, uh, it's something I've never told anybody in public before, but it was, it was it's about a character named T. Bird Murphy, um, whose parents don't live together. The mother uh, sometimes lives with whole gangs of Hell's Angels um, in, in the house where T. Bird Murphy grows up and the Hell's Angels become both his enemies and his protectors. Um, and there's a father, or a man who calls himself the father, who lives in a trailer behind a gas station. And I think for me it was the gas station more than anything else. My own nostalgia for the gas station, having grown up in Los Angeles where my father ran a string of gas stations. And, uh, you know, I, I, from the smell of the grease in the book to the whole gas station idea, I just had to follow the book to the end. I read it compulsively, in one great gulp of reading, and when I was finished I knew I had experienced something special. Um, Eric, who sees himself as something of a modern-day Jack London, and he is, an ironic postmodernist Jack London, had been writing a long novel uh, of many parts of, of Oakland. Its harshness and its violence, its rough beauty. Eric himself has, a, has, a, has, has to tell the story of his life, a hard life that he survived through the loyalty of his stepfather, who stood by him, by the rare good fortune to love reading books at an early age in an environment in which that sort of thing could get you beaten up, and did. Oakland is just across the bay from San Francisco, but it's not San Francisco. It is San Francisco's feral other, 
It's primal, incorrigible alter ego. And Eric knows it from top to bottom, or maybe he knows it from bottom to bottom. <laughs> the characters in his novels, East Bay Grace and, uh, and Welcome to Oakland, they're not victims. They're not losers. They're not subalterns. They have the juice of life stirring in them. And this juice of life is constantly being celebrated by Eric. Actually, by themselves, his books, books brim with an honest vitality. Eric is a trumpet player. And he brings a trumpet player's love of spit and brass, blare and vibrato to his work. The energy in him is all a storytelling energy. Stories flow out of him like motor oil. You may find a rough-edged Eric's writing, a challenging attitude, but it's a calculated rough edge. Oakland is more like Oakland. And at times, Eric may strike you as an East Bay Kerouac in his breathless overflow, only he is much more savvy about prose writing than Kerouac ever was. For plot and characters, he has far more fiendish and wonderful inventions than the Kerouac could ever dream of. Um, I'm not going to read, I wrote a whole a blurb to the book, um, uh, Welcome to Oakland. But I just want to mention that he's got it. There's a new idea in literature. He's really introduced something novel. I call it the Oakland idea. And there's nothing else in American writing like it. It's Jack London in a clown's outfit, mud flat comedy among the garbage heaps and the refineries, rage against the machine, unless it's a motorcycle. Fury against the well-off and the ex-wives. The whole Bukowski and effluvium held together by music, the great flaring trumpet of living itself. T-Bird Murphy, the novel's hero, says of himself, I am by my nature ridiculous. I am the absurd made flesh, and I will endure, and I will prevail. Someday I will wake up and look out over the wasteland of pickled and shredded souls, and my vision will transform the bile of the world in nectar, and I will not be alone. That's the spirit of welcome to Oakland, Welcome to Buffalo. <laughs> yes, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no idea what I'm going to read to you. Yet. Um, first of all, though, thank you, um, Mark, and thanks, Ted, and thanks especially to uh, the college for uh, funding this. Um, so I have great appreciation for the administration of uh, Madai. Um, most book reviews uh, are written by the book review people. And most of these book review people, I've sat on the board of directors of the National Book Critic Circle, these people. And uh, smart as they might be, most of them, um, haven't read deeply in the classics. They, they read all the contemporary stuff because that's how they're making their living. And uh, <clears throat> also the whole book review business. I've written reviews where I said what I wanted to say and for like the Washington Post and have them send it back and say, you, you, you can't uh, be that harsh. I said, why not? And it's because advertisers um, buy space alongside those book reviews. And if you pan a book, that, that uh, publisher might not uh, want you to review any of their, well, they might not give you an ad. Uh, they might, might not buy an ad anymore. And so you can't say nasty things, um, even if they're merited and or true. <laughs> <laughs> it's really ugly. I mean, I've had reviews sent back and I, you know, had heated conversations with editors saying, look, this is a pile of shit. What do you want me to say? I can't put my name to this book and say good things about it because it'll ruin my reputation. I'm an academic, not a professional book reviewer. And uh, I got lucky a few couple of years ago that uh, a French magazine called Transfuge, they uh, had me write an article a month for the magazine over there, and I got to say whatever I wanted to say because my role over there is not to be the naughty American. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a blast. I wrote. So much fun writing these things because I got to tear people new ones, and and, and 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 praise writers who people hadn't heard of, and and as a result, hell, uh, I got like six people's books published over there that they'd never heard of um, from Americans that they're now translating. Um, so I, I, I called the column "Say It Hot," and. Uh, <clears throat> find one of those Say It Hot articles. I know you folks came for story time and you brought your pillows and everything, but I'm going to read it, read it, 
read an essay. Um, so that's not conventional at a reading, but bear with me. I think you might enjoy it. I'll give you a context of this essay. Uh, I loathe the work of John Updike. Just hate it. Um, <laughs> when his characters have tragedies, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> So I wrote an article about it, and uh, I tore him a new one. And this is this is the article. It's called "Mr. Updike, He Dead," and that's that's uh, riffing on uh, Conrad, right? Of what 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 uh, Kurtz says, um, or what's said about Kurtz after after he died. Mr. Updike, He Dead. I wrote this essay two weeks before John Updike died, so I've had to change some verb tenses. <laughs> I sent the essay to a number of writers, all of whom thought it was high time someone said what I said about Updike. Then he died. Hours after Updike's death, I received an email from an author who wrote me only two sentences. You killed him. Good job. <laughs> Several other writers accused me of somehow putting a curse on Updike, working some voodoo on him consorting with wicked powers of darkness to perform the public service of silencing him. I wish my essays really did have the power to do the things they're now being accused of doing. There are some authors I've been meaning to write about. <clears throat> John Updike's newest novel, The Widows of Eastwick, got a literary blowjob in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Tannehaus, the editor, wrote that, quote, Updike has now written tens of thousands of sentences, many of them tiny miracles of transubstantiation, unquote. Updike evidently possessed godlike powers, able to turn sentences into the blood and body of Christ. Year after year, Ivy League literary critics cried foul when word came from Stockholm that once again John Updike had not won the Nobel Prize. You see, John Updike was the perfect little American writer. He never made a mistake. Not with his plots, not with his characters, not with his sentences. He never penned a paragraph that was too long or too short, never employed the wrong punctuation mark. His comma usage was exemplary. <laughs> John Updike never went over the line into the grotesque. He was never offensive. He never, never made a goof in an interview or an essay. The authorities claimed John Updike never farted in a crowded elevator. <laughs> to my knowledge, none of his fictional characters ever took a shit. He went to church and read the daily Bible verse for the congregation, and he sang, too. Reliable sources confirmed that his singing voice was never off-key. John Updike was perfect, which is why he was and remains such an awful writer. He once said about writing, quote, in the end, you're stuck with the fact that this is what you do for a living, unquote. To Updike, writing wasn't an art, it was a job. Reading his novels is like watching, like watching factory workers, hundreds of thousands of little turtlenecked, penny loafered uptights grinning like idiots and whistling while they fasten nuts to bolts on the assembly line of mass produced fiction. I'd rather read Henry Miller's Divine Ramblings, Volman's spectacular eruptions of chaotic noise and image, Dagoberto Gill's peculiar and deliberate and splendid grammatical tongue twisters, Tension's explosive con convoluted leaps of haphazard genius. Faulkner's whiskey-soaked angelic raptures then yawn through a single precision-manufactured sentence written by Updike. About Faulkner, he says, I find him greatly overvalued. His novels strike me as rather coarse and oddly experimental. <laughs> About other writers, he says, I don't think a writer should approach reality with his fists flying, adding, rather than energy and violence at all costs, I prefer things to be neat and precise, domestic writing. Domesticity is precisely what we get with Updike. He's the only writer alive, oops, I mean recently dead or currently alive, uh, who can turn an African coup into a domestic melodrama, or a terrorist plot to detonate a bomb in Manhattan into a Christian allegory about the innate goodness of mankind. That's his book, The Terrorist. John Updike never gambled, never made a mistake, never aspired to more than he was capable of. If you sight your, set your sights low enough, you're going to succeed. Updike was a success. Great works of art, however, always fail. They aspire to the unattainable and the unspeakable. It is the act of striving for the beyond that characterizes masterpieces, that bespeaks the exhilaration of dialogue with the demons and the angels. 
that Updike was a master of the form of the novels without question. That's his problem, though. The form of the tidy and neat 19th century serialized soap opera Anglo novel as an art was obsolete as, at its inception because it wasn't art nor was intended to be. It was a commercial product, authors paid by the word. Its best pedestrian contemporary practitioners, among them Updike, are, were, no more <laughs> artists than are skillful accountants, forgers, lawyers, or prostitutes. On second thought, many prostitutes are sublime artists. <laughs> you can teach a monkey how to perform a trick perfectly. You can teach an illiterate to write a perfectly grammatical sentence. Perfection is the goal of simpletons. Imperfection is a byproduct of genius. Like George W. Book, uh, Bush, Updike was a Christian and therefore had all the answers to the metaphysical questions of the ages. He says, existence is charged with goodness. He knows life is perfect and good because that's the way God made it. As a good Christian, however, Updike the writer encountered a problem. He had only one story to tell. It's the one in which the good guys, even if obligatorily flawed, experience redemption. The bad guys are punished and everything works out in the end. It's the great western lie, the one despots and missionaries sell the people they're conquering. And nowhere outside Islam is it more invidious than in the United States, a nation where the Christian fairy tale is a commodity, marketed, packaged, and sold to a population stupefied on cathode rays and Jesus salesmen. Says Updike, spires you see in a small town or city do bring hope, and hope brings energy. What never occurred to Updike is the church spires in small towns across America, as often as not, have signified lynch mobs, hooded clansmen, and bigoted, racist, redneck halfwits who couldn't count their 11 toes. In hell, where I'm most certainly headed, <laughs> the bookshelves will be lined with imperfect books with failures, books like Ulysses, Under the Volcano, A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, Moby Dick, Germain, Don Quixote, Leaves of Grass, Les Fleurs du Mal. There we'll find Shakespeare's plays, Tristram Shandy, Rabelais, War and Peace, the unfinished and therefore imperfect novels of Kafka. It'll be different in heaven where Updike reckoned he was going. There, Mr. Updike will find nothing but perfect books. I hope Updike has to read them all especially his own, over and over again. <laughs> Bored out of his mind for eternity, a divine and just reward for squandering his, his linguistic skills on perfection. <laughs> <laughs> students how to write criticism if you're an English professor, for instance, if you're not doing it yourself. So I have lots of beefs when, when you have people that, uh, you know, across America teaching in academia that don't write essays. I think it's very important, and this is just professor in me, because I know most of you are students. It's like, if you want to be a creative writer, one of the best ways to learn what you're doing wrong is to uh, write criticism about other people's stuff, because then you'll say, man, this really sucks. Like, Oops, that's what I do. Change what you do. Okay. Lighten up here a little bit. This this one's uh, this one's different than the uh, uh, roll of many of my other pieces, so it's weird. And so I'm going to read it to you because it, to show that I'm not just a ranting and raving lunatic. It's called Hope Among Other Vices and Virtues. Four years ago, Duke. My neighbor and employer's husband introduced me to Agnes, my employer's daughter. Duke did this before he was my friend. <laughs> Agnes said, I like you. You are everything in a man I want to change. <laughs> <laughs> my employer and her daughter Agnes lived down the street from the apartment complex in which Duke and I leased one room flats. The women live in the house Duke built. When we look out the window at Duke's flat, we see the house he built, magnolias spread over the lawn, the branches of live oaks arc over the cobbled street of our Texas town. I planted the live oaks when Agnes was born, Duke says, the magnolias when my spouse severed our relations. When the wind blows, Duke and I watch loose shingles on the roof flutter like a stadium 
of applauding hands. Envy. From the window of Duke's flat, we see the women attempt to leave for shopping. We see them try to start the car and find the battery dead. Their looks of frustration. They're trekked back inside the house where they use the telephone to call Duke and me. Duke and I do not answer our telephones. Because we do not answer our telephones, the women sneak up on our apartment complex in hopes of catching us boozing. The women are dismayed when Duke and I booze, either independently or, as is our custom, in manly tandem. They are dismayed when we go to the shooting range together. They are dismayed by the relative proximity of our flats. They suspect us of covering for each other when we do things we should not be doing. When armies are mobilized and issues joined, Duke says, the man who is sorry over the fact will win. Lao Tzu. Life is a hair shirt, I concur. <laughs> Lust. We live in a difficult situation, Duke and I. His spouse will not divorce him, and yet she will not grant him admission to enjoy the luxuries of her bedroom. Agnes, Duke's daughter, and the daughter of my employer, refuses, like her mother, to grant me the use of her feminine upholstery. Although we terminated our courtship four years ago, she continues as if we had not. With great tact, I have suggested that our acquaintance has outlived its pleasantness, though I have not <laughs> told her in verum pro liberate ruebant. I have not told her my digestion gives me great concern these days. I fully intend to tell Agnes these things eventually, and with effusion. Agnes's mother, however, is my employer. Wrath. No quantity of flowers can temper the wrath of Agnes. The wrath of Agnes can be overt at times, subtle at others. One time, during the second year of our acquaintance, Agnes put Bessie Mae Smith on the record player. I knew what that meant. I know what this means, I said. Agnes pretended she did not understand. When I informed Duke of the incident, he poured gin, our beverage of choice. He played his Furt Wangler Rheingold and he closed his eyes, not unemotionally. Duke handed me the gin tumbler and shook his head. You have my complete sympathy, Duke said, in this matter. Sloth. Agnes liked me when we first met. I boozed with great zeal at that time. Then she stopped liking me. She asked me to stop boozing. I will like you more, she asserted, when you stop boozing. I stopped boozing, mostly. Still, Agnes did not like me. I booze with Duke. Agnes suspects this, but can prove nothing. Although she will not admit me to the diamond tucks of her custom upholstery, she forbids me the company of other women. Nights, she walks outside my window, spying on me. When she believes she sees me doing something I should not be doing, she drops by unannounced, if uninvited. She searches my apartment for women and booze, and when she finally finds my booze, hidden beneath my mattress, she pours it down the sink with great ceremony. I am a tidy person. I am not one to keep my women hidden beneath a mattress. <laughs> Justice. Though I do my utmost to hide them other places. Early in the third year of my acquaintance with Agnes, I brought a woman to my flat to show her my Plata Helmet collection and other wares equally of note. A knocking on my door interrupted a considerable examination of Gefroids, both rare and of common variety. We should remain quiet. I told the woman, quiet is best at such times. I took her in my arms with expression. The knocking continued. I was soon in harmony by a voice both shrill and familiar. He's showing you his prize nemelethines, no doubt, Agnes screamed. The woman recoiled, and I was obliged to release her from my expressive embrace. After the woman made her exit, Agnes made her entrance. Agnes discovered my distilled spirits beneath my mattress. She stood over my sink, pouring. You have flipped an opportunity, Agnes said. I was contraceptually prepared. <laughs> I rearranged my collection. Dread rose in delicate tendrils from the sunk tank of my soul. Prudence. I keep my booze at Duke's now. As his wife, my employer, has not been inside his flat these past 15 years, since the day she found it for him. At Duke's, my booze rests undetected. When I'm sure Agnes is asleep, I go to Duke's. We drink until the morning train rattles down the tracks behind our flats. Then we go to work. 
<laughs> By the time we get home from work, we are both sober enough to face the women, if we are beckoned to do so. <laughs> Why do we live like this? The examined life, Duke says, is not worth living. <laughs> Gluttony. Agnes stops by my flat unannounced and uninvited. She is wearing makeup, and her clothing is uncharacteristically fashionable. I bought new lingerie, she says. May I come in? Inside, Agnes walks my flat as if a model on a runway. Agnes takes off her skirt and unbuttons her sheer blouse. So, Agnes says, what do you think? I approach alluringly, seductively, some would say expertly. My floor shines are polished like onyx, and their squeaks are not inaudible. Agnes buttons her blouse and pulls up her skirt. She zips with great ceremony. All you want me for is sex, Agnes says. Agnes looks at herself in the mirror. I understand, Agnes says, <laughs> though I do not approve. I believe I should say something. I consider my options and the possibilities of interpretation thereof. I don't say anything. Temperance. Duke is a maker of bullets and a reloader of shotgun shells. Every day when Duke goes to the range to test out a new bullet or a new powder, he saves his brass and his shells and brings them home for reloading. Duke is concerned with environmental waste. Sometimes Duke takes me to the range. He brings pistols and rifles and shotguns and we shoot at targets or clay pigeons. Duke can hit the clay pigeons with his pistols. Duke is a very good shot. From 400 yards, Duke says, looking at the house he built, I could hit a diamond in a goat's ass. Pride. Why your acute interest in ammunition, I ask? I'm in search of the perfect bullet, Duke responds. Faith. Not long ago, Duke's spouse, my employer, and her daughter Agnes spend the evening at St. Anthony's, the local branch of the Catholic Church, where they drink wine. Wine is alcohol, I note. Do you not find your stance concerning my occasional alcoholic beverage in conflict with an activity of which you are soon to partake? Agnes touches the cue lever on her phonograph, on which Bessie Mae Smith already rests spinning on the platter. My aversion to this singer grows like a well-fertilized wart on the nose of my indignity. <laughs> At the bar, Duke and I use cash. Credit card bills have been used as evidence of moral turpitude, though they prove nothing conclusively. We do not speak of the women. Instead, Duke breaks three snifters over the brows of impolite patrons as a favor to the effeminate, mustached barkeep. The barkeep, without expressing gratitude, requests we quit the premises. As we begin our departure, Duke notes a cardboard placard of the entertainer, Elvira, dressed in tight black satin, propped abundantly by the door. In Duke's flat, the telephone rings without let, and we sit in clandestine darkness. Duke and the cardboard Elvira at his ammunition table, myself in a strategically placed folding chair by the window, looking down the street at Duke's house. Duke duct tapes an Astra 44 snub nose revolver to Elvira's shapely cardboard hand. On his knees, Duke begs for assistance. Elvira does not comply, and Duke pours a gin and turns out the light. If a position is formless, Duke says, the most carefully concealed spies will not be able to get a look at it, and the wisest counselors will not be able to lay plans against it, Sun Tzu. There are oil slicks in the harbor, I agree, but that is preferable to periscopes. Avarice. I want a bevy of zoot suited handmaidens to jitterbug around my flat while I play Charlie Parker tunes on a throat warbler and drink fruity rum-based cocktails. Fortitude. Accompanied by my employer, Agnes has decided upon a china pattern, a tastefully spare floral design, I have been informed. I do not question their taste in these matters. There are men in the world who deserve as stern an exultation from the proximity of disaster. Um, as others from success, Duke says. Churchill. It's better to be shot by the wrong gun, I reply, than not to be shot at all. <laughs> hope. At times when we booze, we hope the situation will change, Duke and I. There's that. <laughs> And I, and I 
know what it's like to be at a reading sitting on the other side over there and, and how, how you know your ass starts hurting and it's like fishing and everything. So I'm gonna read just a, an excerpt from my from my new book. Um, Pop hopped up to the band. This is this uh, the father of the narrator's getting married, um, and, he, and he plays trumpet. Um, and I guess that's about all you need to know. Pop walked up to the band. They cut the disco crap mid riff. The amps buzzed, and we were quiet. Pop took his horn from its case. It shone through its soot tarnish. His hands were inked with grease, even though he'd probably scrubbed them raw with an SOS pad. He took the mic and said, "This song is dedicated to my bitch." And the band kicked in, and it was a slow blues. As time goes by, sleazy and sexy, and washed with all the sadness and joy and ass-cake horse-whipped gruel of our place, of our Oakland, of the docks and piers and factories, and of the railroad tracks and slaughterhouse fume, and the Harley, the Hershey ass-crid stink that somehow became chocolate, of the General Mills plant that made you yak your throat into your hands when you walked past, of all the Chinese and Negroes and the Japanese internment survivors, and of all the Okies like us who came to California desperate for a vine to bite and a piece of dirt that would give grain, and the beat of the music and the walk of the bass and the slow and sparse chords of the Hammond organ slipped into the air like the slimy ooze of late night, tenth time in the day, fucking. Man, those boys sat down like it was only in the universe the song they were playing, the great and almighty song of fuck and fuck and more fuck more. <laughs> and Pop brought his horn, the old family trumpet that had been the trumpet of his father before him, and that someday when I could again play, and when Pop deemed me worthy of the horn's ancestry, would be mine. Brought the horn to his lips, cracked with ten worlds of radiator fan wind, and creased with valleys of oil and grease that would never wear away. Brought that horn up and pressed his lips to the mouthpiece, and with the bellows of his chest, with the force of all his anguish and love and lust and will to endure, the force of all that constituted what he was, and the force of what he would be and had been, the force of a man who should not be standing sure-footed and planted, but who should instead have been pile-driven into the asphalt earth like the ruins of a splendid society, the likes of which man would be better off never having known. With force and yet with restraint, the restraint of a million years of doing the shit work for brutes bigger or smarter or less compassionate and therefore more powerful. The restraint of the man at work upon whom his family depends for sustenance for bread and water and fire and skins, the humility and seething rage boil of a man for whom a ten-state murder spree is never more than an insult away, never more than a single instance of despair from becoming a plan, a vocation, a mission, a relief and justification for the life of endless, constant pain and silence and sucking it the fuck up. To be an American, to be an American and a man, an American, a man and a working man is to be a sultan of restraint, gorgeous, enslaved, and eager women wagging in front of your face and you have no hint of a hard on. If there weren't laws and we weren't so shit scared of them, each of us each day would kill, and not just kill with discretion, but sure and steady and satisfied impunity. If I meet an American man who claims he doesn't want to kill at least once a day, each day of his life, and you've found a lying son of a bitch, one you better watch out for because he just might want to kill you. Trust me, I never <laughs> lie. <laughs> And even though I shivered watching Pop swell, I wanted to see Pop other than he was. I had some questions I wanted to ask Pop. I wanted to ask Pop why he quit playing his music, though Pop had made excuses, blaming the bitch, the whore, the cunt, the cuz, my mother. The cause of all that was shit, not only in his life, but in the lives of all men. My mother, the ruin of Oakland, the downfall of the Union, the reason the gooks got there, kicked our asses in both Korea and Nam, the reason the blacks overran the nice neighborhoods, the reason car parts were going over to the metric system, and hard-working American mechanics were having to retool their socket sets, my mother the slept behind the conspiracy to destroy the non-homo white male and replace him with a panty-wearing army of three-piece Florsheim-wearing faggots. That's why Pop couldn't play the goddamn trumpet anymore. For if he did, the divorce gods would dis descend and strip him of all he had left, his trailer, his new bitch, and his tools. <laughs> I knew this already, though. Knew it by heart and by cadence, and I wanted to ask Pop 
If though he no longer played, he still heard music in the world. If there was music in the clack of the jackhammer, in the hydraulic moan of the dynaho, the whine of bobcat and the arc sound wrecking ball swing. If now that he spent his time breaking down truck tires and felt in his hands the sledgehammer instead of the trumpet, felt his viscera vibrate with the rhythms of air compressor instead of with string bass and piano and his own fingers caressing the pads of the trumpet. If now that he beat things level with earth instead of ascending with the muses and angels, he had achieved some hidden sinister goal, some act of revenge against himself, his family, his people, and his mysterious nameless gods. I wanted to ask Pop if the music of his past, the music of his blood, the notes of mothers and fathers' voices before him haunted him in his dreams. I wanted to ask Pop if he was like an old piano whose keys had not been touched in a generation. The marrow in the white and black keys dried and drained for lack of touch, for lack of flesh on bone. When I was a boy, I used to listen to Pop play trumpet at the Baptist church with the old jazz men. White-haired men with work-blacked faces wearing shipyard blues and machinist coveralls. Their names stitched to their work clothes in red, horn cases beaten like toolboxes. I listened to Pop and I sat on the pews and looked at the cross in the shadows of the after hours and the church smelled of cigars and gin and menthols. The pastor at the piano singing his chords as he played them. His voice, many voices stacked upon each other as if babel instead of being a cacophony of noise where instead language turned chorale, and that chorale turned jazz mass by the magical solo fugue of the pastor, his voice booming like a section of perfectly harmonized trombones. The drummers in this church, and with my father, not drummers, but instead musicians, who understood that the drum no more carries the beat than does the bass or the horns or the piano, but is itself an instrument of music, and each drumstick against calfskin or sheepskin contains within the stroke and impact the possibility of not merely a single percussive percu punctuation, but the certainty of all notes playing at the same time. And each tom-tom and floor-tom and bass drum and cymbal and hi-hat contains in itself the expanse and range of the sounds of nature. The drum not something beaten, but something played, music lifting rather than being hammered out. The trumpets and trombones, oars mined from earth and forged and wrought into brass and silver extensions of veins and arteries and lungs, and I would squint so bright with the star fires that shot from the horns twisting in the candle flames and pit lights. Those horns born in the fires of earth and even when pianissimo seemingly crouched and waiting to attack with the ferocity of beasts untamed and primordial with lust and passion and the sex of the earth's ongoing creation. These primal heralds, the troubadours of war, goat hooved satyrs of cities ancient and rising phoenixed into the dark and darkening skies of jazz. The upright bass and its womanly shaped basses never sitting but standing and not just standing but entwined with the wood and gut string and pressed into the instrument like lovers into loved. Always restrained, eternal foreplay, fingering the strings now in gentle strokes and now plucking as if to punch. And the sound of the bass itself rolling slow through the church. But none of these instruments, none of the sounds made by the transformation of nature into the appendages of man struck me as did the sound of my own father's horn. And I could tell the sound of Pop's trumpet amid a line of 15. I could tell the sound of Pop's lips on the mouthpiece, the old silver con held together by Pop's father's own handicraft with soldering iron and file. Its sound when Pop played, cascading over the other players like a room of strings down, bearing, at, down beating at the opening of a Mahler symphony, which I, the child, did not recognize or realize until the first time I heard Mahler many years later when I was in college and trying to impress a girl and took her therefore to the symphony where with a downbeat of Mahler's resurrection symphony stroked I said pop and I wept and the girl at my side dumbfounded and saying yes it's beautiful and I with my face in my hand saying softly and again you don't understand you can't understand this sound which issued forth from my father's trumpet was the wind pirouetting through the tulis the sound of a storm gale blowing over the open pipes of a playground jungle gym. The howl of a chimney in a hurricane. Pop seemed to me then not my father alone, nor the son of man, but a being wholly inhuman, wholly at one with the elements from which the trumpet was made, and those elements combined to be, bring the trumpet vibrating into life. And I, I remembered being too young to walk on my own, unable to speak the voices within myself sitting in the pew and understanding that I was in a holy place.
I, uh, I short readings feel better than long ones if you're in the audience. I'm just going to usually uh, understand. So thank you for being here. We have uh, four of Herrick's books here. If you're uh, interested, uh, they're all at very handsome discounts. And thank you all very much for coming. And hope to see you again November 11th. Of course.